And uh, I told you last week that it was one of those uh, uh, chapters and verses that I wanted to preach on and uh, just had to wait for the Lord to lead and to guide me as far as the scriptures and the text goes. Luke chapter 18 verses 1 through 9 and, uh, and it's a good thing that I waited because it helped me to set some straight things straight as far as my thinking and uh, that sort of thing goes. And and sometimes, I've heard it preached on many different occasions that this just goes right along with some of the other passages. Like, you, you know, you read to the, um, the friend that goes and he knocks at the door, and I mentioned this last week. The friend that will go and he'll knock at the door and say, Hey friend, you know, I got somebody that is a stranger. He, he's a friend of mine. He came here at night and I don't have anything to set before him. And he begins to knock and knock and knock. And he answers because, not, not just because he's his friend, but because it's the right thing to do. And he didn't want to shame upon his name. And then the father also. But I originally thought that maybe this would have something parallel to do with one with the other, but I've learned that that's not the case. And uh, so sometimes the Holy Spirit has us to wait until uh, he, has, he has more to show us, and that's exactly the case for me anyway. I, sometimes I'm a slow learner, and uh, it takes me a little bit while to get things. So Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 9, I entitled this, The Cries of Man for the Coming of Christ. It says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge that feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward, he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest her continually coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. Now I tell you that he will avenge them speedily, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Well, let's pray as we get into the lesson for tonight. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray you would just be with us tonight. Open up our eyes, our ears, give us understanding, and uh, help challenge us in your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, as we get into the text, we, we, we know the things that we're called to do. It reveals a lot about our hearts. And so, for instance, when it comes to the area of giving... Uh, you know, the giving reveals a lot about our hearts. You know, some pr people say, well, if you show me your checkbook, it shows me where your heart is, whether it's on the things of God or whether it's on, uh, on this world, because, you know, wherever you're giving your money. And just like Malachi would say over Malachi chapter 3, he says, the stuff that you're trying to give to God, you would never give to your governors. You would never give uh, to those who are office holders or any, even your best friend you wouldn't give these things to. But you want to give that to God. It's your... your it's the least of what you have. It's everything that you have left over, and you're trying to give your leftovers unto God. That's not the way it ought to be. He says, give the first fruits. Get the best of what you have to God. And it reveals a lot about our hearts, and we certainly understand that. And then our service. You know, our service reveals a lot about you know, how we view God. Because the Holy Ghost, He's given us gifts among men. That's what my Sunday school lesson was about. And since he's given everybody a gift, some people sit back and they say, well, you know, I don't have to do anything. I'll just come, show up, do nothing, and I'm fine with that. You know, I'll just learn, and that's all I want to be is a lifelong learner. And that, that's it's fine that you want to learn, but we ought to want to serve. And it uh, shows us where our hearts is. And the same is true when it comes to the area of prayer. Because our prayers reveal a lot about our hearts. And when we look at the Scriptures, when it comes to the area of prayer, I mean, you get excited when you see the different things when it talks about prayer, about how God is rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. And, you know, we, we, love, we love those rewards. We love the fact that God's always taking care of us. And when it comes to Matthew chapter 6... And they're concerned about all the cares of the world. And they say, well, where are we going to get our clothes? Where are we going to get our food? And, and Jesus tells them in essence, He says, don't worry about all that. Just seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. And when we go to God in prayer, it brings a certain peace when it comes to the things of this world. Because God loves us as His own children, right? We know in Jeremiah 33, 3, Call upon me and I'll show you great mighty things which thou knowest not. 
the, the greatest things in the world comes to us through the matter of prayer, through our relationship, and it shows you a lot of what it has to do with our prayer life. And of course, in Hebrews chapter 11, it's that Hebrew hall of faith, and it's an interesting where the Bible slows down to those two key people there in the Bible, Abraham and Moses. Both of them were called the friends of God in the Scripture. Both of them spent a lot of time in prayer with God. Both of them sought God. One of them went and tarried, went, followed God into a far land. He didn't even know where he was going. He was just following. And Sarah asked Abraham, where are we going? And he said, I don't know. Just going where God wants me. <laughs> but they got that in prayer. You know, sometimes in this world we're prone to faint. We're prone to give up. We're prone to give in. We're prone to throw in the towel and say, you know what, God's just not hearing. God's just not answering. God's just not concerned about what I'm going through. As someone once said this, what you are in your prayer closet will directly affect what you are in your public arena. So why don't we pray more? Because this passage teaches us that God is directly involved in our lives through prayer, and yet some people act like God doesn't even care about them. You ever meet people like that? God doesn't care about me. He doesn't care what's troubling me. I've prayed for years and it still hasn't changed. i still got this health issue and, and it's still there. God must not care about me. Well, maybe He's trying to teach us something. I don't know. I don't know. But here Jesus gives this parable and uh, when I look into it, it's interesting. Not only the parable, but the contrast that we see within it. The parable itself, you know, it's just, you, you break it down, you see this little widow woman. And a widow woman doesn't have much power in this world. She doesn't have much authority. All the, who, who's the ones in authority back in that society? It's, it's mostly the men who have property and power and so forth. Those are the ones. This is a widow woman. She don't have anybody to intercede for her or to take her request or anything else. And something's happened to her. We don't know what it is. We can only imply that maybe uh, the, the fact that she's a widow, maybe that has something to do with it. We don't know the details, but she's going to a judge in the city in which she's a citizen, and she goes and she begins to knock at the door of that judge every single day. And this is a judge that doesn't even care about God. Can you imagine that? doesn't care about God. God's not in his thoughts, not in his mind. He, he, the guy doesn't even regard man. He's in his own little power bubble and he says, I don't care what man does. You know, I'm, all I care about is this office that I'm holding. And she goes and she knocks on the door and she, he looks out there and sees a widow woman and he tells her, she starts sharing the problems. He says, get lost. And this woman's sort of like that guy, that young little scrapping little boy. He keeps getting in a fight over and over. He won't just get up, give in and give up. He just keeps coming back for more. That's this lady. He tells her no one day, she comes back the next. He says, no, I told you no, lady, I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to hear your, 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 your trouble. I'm not going to hear your case. I'm not going to hear your, what you have to talk about. i got bigger issues and bigger, bigger fish to fry. And yet, she keeps coming. A week goes by, a month goes by, and she's still showing up at the door. All the neighbors are noticing that everybody else says, hey, aren't you going to do something? This, this lady keeps sitting at the door. Aren't you going to hear what she has to say? And finally he says, man, she will not give up. She will not give in. She's not listening to a word that I say. I guess I'm going to have to do something, so she'll just finally quit. There must be something to the case or else she wouldn't keep coming to me. And after a while he answers... This, this little widow woman. Now again, there's contrast between what's going on between this judge and our almighty judge, Jesus, or God, Jesus Christ. Because God is a just God. Even Abraham says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? That's, that's our God. And our God is not weary. We can go to Him any hour, any day, any time. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. He never gives in. He doesn't... He's always waiting to hear our prayers. He's not like this unjust judge who says, you know, uh, is that that widow woman again? Tell her I'm not here. Tell her I'm sick. Or what, why don't I just go hide out back? Park my car three blocks down the road so she don't know my car is here. No, God's always available. He 
He's not trying to hide from us. He's not trying to avoid us. And He's a good judge, and He always does what's right, and He never tries to avoid us. And we, guess what? As, as, as the disciples are compared to the widow woman, we, we have a greater opportunity than the widow woman ever did because we have a God who wants to hear from us and wants to answer us. And our citizenship is from heaven. And our God always bends low His ear to hear everything that we have to say. He's always wanting to know what's on our heart. He knows what's on our mind before we even speak it. Many times, I guess we try to bring God down to our level and we, we get to the idea, well, we think of the judges in our neighborhoods and in our areas, and, and maybe it's not like this, but I've, it seems like some of the judges you go to, and it's like they're as corrupt as could be. That's not all of them, but, but certainly we know that there's some judges out there that, that would fit that kind of bill. I'm not, I'm not trying to cover all judges to be that way, because I know that there's some good judges. There's always some good judges that are out there. But sometimes we, we say to ourselves, well, this judge does not care about me. He doesn't, he doesn't care about doing right. He doesn't care about what's just. He, he's, he's all involved in the politics and everything else. And there's no justice in this earth. And there's no justice in this world. And so why are we going to bother with him? He doesn't care about us. Many times that's how we view, because we bring God down. And we try to put them in what we see and what we perceive in our little world when the other way ought to be the effect. We ought to go up to Him, not try to bring Him down, to, but we ought to go up to Him and see things His ways through His eyes. Because God never done anything, has never done anything wrong. He's never done anything wrong. God in heaven always regards His people the fact of the matter is, the Bible says we have not because we ask not. We ask not. Here in our text, in the Bible, I believe that will not only give us hope, again, just like the, in Matthew 6.33 where he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. I believe the same kind of matter is what we have before us when it comes to the area of justice. Well, we think of ourselves, how in the world do we want to survive in an unjust world where there's persecution and trouble and hardships and, and everything else? How in the world are we going to survive? Well, God will take care of us, and He assures us of that here in this text. And it will give us a peace and confidence in God, God in the hardest, hardest of life's difficulties. But we must keep coming to God in prayer and look for His deliverance. Uh, in a world where everything is going wrong, we ought to be increasing our prayers not praying less. You know, I'll speak for myself for just a moment, but sometimes we get in the area of where we'll look at the news stations and everything else and we'll say, what else could go wrong? I mean, what else are they going to do to us? What, else, what, what other kind of rights are they going to take away from us? I mean, what, what, what worse of a person can you put in office? I mean, and you go down the list because we look at the news stations and what's the first thing that we do? We begin to murmur and we begin to complain, right? And so that's probably one of the things where we ought to just stop looking at the news. And so I'm just telling my, my story. I'm not telling your story, but my story is sometimes I look at the news and the first thing that I do is I'll, I'll sit next to Did you hear what's in the news today? Can you... Can you believe this? I thought, I thought we had seen it all already, but here's something else. Now what in the world is going... This doesn't even make sense. And that's my murmuring. And that's my complaining. But instead of murmuring and complaining, what ought we ought to be doing? We ought to be praying, right? Instead of murmuring and complaining, we ought to be praying. And this is what I'm trying to get across for you tonight because our praying reveals our faith. Jesus spoke a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray. And that can be a hard thing to do, especially when you don't feel like it. But it doesn't matter about our feelings, it matters about our faith. That's what Christ likes as our faith. It's interesting in Acts chapter 4, verse 23, Peter and John, they're 
appearing before the Sanhedrin after they heal a man, and they, I mean, they just got, everybody's looking, and they're, they're, they're seeing this guy has just been healed, and it says everybody wondered at the great marvelous works that God had done, and now all of a sudden they're put before the Sanhedrin, and they're standing trial, and they see that there's nothing they can do, do about it. The thing that bothers them the most is that they're preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus Christ, and they're healing in the name of Jesus Christ, and I think if they would take that out, that they wouldn't, probably wouldn't have had any problem with it. But the fact that Jesus is involved in it, now all of a sudden they have problems. And they said, this is what we got to do. We need to threaten them and tell them, charge them straight away. You ought not to preach in the name of Jesus Christ. Stop teaching, stop preaching, stop going in the name of Jesus Christ. Or else something worse is going to happen unto you. And they didn't really think through the threats as of yet. But I'm sure that that's really what it boiled down to. But what do they do? They go back to their homes and say, "What well, you, you ought to hear what, they, what just happened to us. I mean, the life is not fair, and this is, this is unjust, and this, this shouldn't happen here in our land. We're Israel. This ought never to happen where God ought to be magnified and lifted up. That, that's not what they did. They didn't go back and complain about the Sanhedrin and said, Did you know so-and-so was sitting there on the court against us and charged us straight away? Don't preach in the name of Jesus Christ. They weren't murmuring, they weren't complaining, you want to know what they did. They went straightway back to their friends, back to their brethren, back to the believers in Jesus Christ. They said, this is what happened to us. Now let us go to God in prayer and see what He says. And I said, Lord, give us boldness that we might speak in the name of Jesus Christ. And so they pushed it all through the area of prayer, like we would do. We would murmur and complain, but no, they went to prayer. They went to prayer. They reported what had happened to the brethren and then had a prayer meeting about it. And in fact, much of the book of Acts in times of persecution and hardships, you'll find this church always doing one thing. They continually prayed even when Paul, Peter was in prison. Paul, writing to the Romans, he connects the thoughts as Jesus did in Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 12, I believe it is. Let me turn back there. Romans chapter 12, verse 12. He says this. I want to make sure that I get it right. Uh, this is going through the long list after he tells them, you know, I beseech you therefore, brethren, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. But in verse 12 he tells us, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Continuing instant in prayer. So he connects the same dice that Jesus connects. And in fact, when you look at that word instance, it means to continue on steadfastly, always, without giving up in fervency, uh, praying, 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 without fainting, devoting yourself to prayer. And so don't avenge yourselves, but leave vengeance to the Lord. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4-6 through 6 says this, it says, So that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your, your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is a manifest token of righteous judgment of God, that you might be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer, seeing it's a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Now this is one of the, I mean, Paul had only spent three weeks with this church. And they set him up and he established them. And next thing you know, all the Judaizers and everybody else is coming. Persecution comes knocking at their door. And I mean, it couldn't get any rougher for this little place, this little church that they're trying to get started. And Paul tells me, he says, don't worry about what they're doing to you because God is going to repay them for their evil that they're doing unto you. Don't try to get back at them. Don't try to you know, set them up. Don't try to get... Don't, it's not this for that or anything else. Just leave it into the hands of God. They could do far better than what we could do. Our what we ought to do is be trying to win them for Jesus Christ. After that, Paul speaks of the second coming of Christ who will judge this world in righteousness and we ought to bring everything to God in prayer. Why? Because God will right every wrong in His time. And that's what I like about it. You know, it's obvious as long as we're in this world, there's going to be a lot of wrongs done to you 
There's going to be a lot of wrongs done to me. There's going to be a lot of wrongs in this world. But in due time, Jesus Christ is going to right every wrong in this world. Now, the context goes all the way back to Luke chapter 17, verse 20. And uh, in Luke chapter 17, verse 20, it says this, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So Luke chapter 17 through 17, 20 onward gives the context. And the Pharisees derided Jesus and asked him, Where's your kingdom if you're David's son? Where's the kingdom if you are the king of Israel who was during the millennial reign? And Jesus plainly states to him, Hey, the kingdom of God is here. It's within you. It doesn't come with observation. It's within you. And in other words, uh, you know, it's, it's not... It, What's the first thing that Jesus Christ is going to do? He tells us in verse 25. Chapter 17, verse 25. What does it say? But first he must suffer many things and be rejected of this, tri- this uh, generation. The kingdom of God wasn't going to be set up as of yet, but the kingdom of, of God is within you, which means that you know, they had their opportunity to accept Him as their Messiah at any time. They just weren't willing to accept Him in His first coming. They should have been waiting for Him and looking for Him, but they weren't looking. They weren't waiting. They didn't like the Messiah that God was giving to them, and so they rejected Him. But again, this generation will reject Jesus Christ. He'll go to the cross of Calvary, But he also gives assurance of his soon return. And between the resurrection or the ascension of Christ and the return of Christ, the children of God will face trouble and persecution for their faith. And it will happen. So how are we to live in consideration of the fact? Well, basically, Peter tells us in his epistle, he tells us this, Rejoice if if any man suffer as a Christian. Isn't that what he says? I think it's his second epistle. No, it's his first epistle. Rejoice if any man suffer as a Christian. Let him suffer as somebody who's suffering for well-doing according to his conscience' sake and not according to evil-doing. Let him rejoice that he suffer for Christ's sake. He tells us to sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man and to ask you for the reason for the hope that's within you. So if somebody comes up to you and they begin to, 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 to give you all kinds of problems because you, you just happen to believe in Jesus Christ, you happen to believe that you are a sinner, He died for your sins, and He's coming back again, and He will judge the world in righteousness, and you happen to believe that, well, not everybody's going to like it. Not everybody's going to care for that. But if they persecute you, that's all right. Be ready to give an answer for the hope that's in you. And even Isaiah tells us the same thing. In Isaiah chapter 8, verses 12 through 13, tells us the very same thing. He says, Don't fear their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts Himself. And let Him be your fear, let Him be your dread, and He shall be for a sanctuary. Not only should we rejoice, but also to realize, as it says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, For the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. And our attitude on earth is to remain sober, to be level-headed, to hope to the end. And we could go to various scriptures tonight, but let me, let me just go through Psalm 37 for you. Uh, our old man, Mr. Edwards, this was one of his favorite psalms. And, uh, you know, he, he was a lovely old man. Uh, definitely in his 80s, but he would a lot of times tell us, this is the fret not psalm. The fret not psalm. And it breaks down some of the, a lot of the same things that I've already been telling you. It's from the heart of David as he gives it unto us, but he tells us a lot of the same things. Psalm 37 says this, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. Says God's going to take care of it. So what's our attitude to be in light of all this? Well, he tells us in the next few few verses, he says, trust in the Lord. 
Delight thyself in the Lord. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass, and He shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the new day. In other words, God will reveal your righteousness in due time. You don't have to go and prove to the whole world that you're such a righteous person. No, God, God will stand for you. He'll be your advocate. He'll watch over you. Rest in the Lord, cease from anger, and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth. In other words, you know, it's going to come. It's not happened yet, but it will come. Don't be like unto them, because God will punish the evildoers. But wait upon the Lord, and you'll see the end of your faith. You'll see that, that land that you've been waiting for, you'll inherit the earth or the would-be promised kingdom. Verse 12 tells us, The wicked plotteth against the just, and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him. He, shall, he seeth that his day is coming. Verse 34, Wait on the Lord. Again, I, I emphasize the wait because this is the same thing that Jesus emphasizes over in Luke chapter 17 and 18. Waiting. Wait on the Lord, keep His way, He shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, and thou shalt see it, I have seen the wicked in great power, spreading himself like a green bay tree, yet he passed away, and lo, he was not, yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Mark the perfect man. Behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace, but transgressors shall be destroyed together, and the end of the wicked shall be cut off. And that's what the whole psalm is all about. Our attitude in the midst of affliction from evildoers. Most people, when they get to this parable, they'll get to the point where they'll say, you know what we ought to do? You know what this parable is teaching? If you want anything in the world, all you got to do is keep pestering God and keep pestering God and keep pestering God and finally He'll give in and get you what you want. He'll get tired of you and he'll finally give you what you want. I'm glad that some parents might be like that. And your kids might go up to you and say, Daddy, can I get some ice cream? Daddy, can I get some ice cream? And, and finally you just had an all right, kid. That hasn't happened in my home, by the way. But, you know, but some, sometimes that's the way it is. And you've seen it. You know, the kids at the grocery store where the parents are embarrassed by the kids acting up and carrying on. All right, get the box of cereal. Let's get to the checkout line and get out of here before anybody knows who I am and I'm even in the store. Here's the crying. Let me get out of here. God's not like that. God's not like that at all. Notice verse 7. It's not about getting what we ask for, but verse 7 tells us this. In chapter 18, verse 7, it says, And shall not God... Avenge his own elect. Who's that? The children of God, which cry day and night unto him. What's that all about? Well, John the Baptist was one who was like a voice crying out in the wilderness. In other words, he was preaching all the time. Isaiah had the same sort of calling in his life. Uh, Isaiah chapter 57, I believe it is. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions, and Jacob their sins. You know, I, I believe that uh, John the Baptist had such a voice that everybody, I mean, everybody was coming around to see him, to be baptized of him. He was constant. There was never a day where he stopped preaching. He was preaching all the time. The Lord is coming. He'll judge the unrighteous. And that's why they would come to him and say, what, was, what must we do in order to be baptized by you? James chapter 5, verse 4. This, you know, I'm, I'll just give you that as a way by way of context of what it means to cry out over and over and over and over and over again. But James chapter 5, verse 4. James is talking to those who are really unjust masters over their laborers who come to work for them. And he says, Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, 
crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. In other words, you know, you think that you're getting away with something here on this earth right now, but the cries of all your laborers, because they know that you're keeping back their wages by fraud, you're taking advantage of these people, and every one of those cries are going up into the ears of the Lord, and He knows about your injustice, He knows what you're doing to these people, He knows how you're taking advantage of them. Does that remind you of something else? What does it say back in Genesis chapter 12? Where the Lord of hosts and the two angels come by and they, they're heading to the land of Sodom and they go and tell Abraham, he says, The cries of Sodom and Gomorrah hath come up unto me and I'm going to go down and check out to see whether those things are so. What does it say about the Exodus there when they get into where God appears before Moses? He says, I've seen their afflictions, I've heard their cries by reason of their taskmasters, and I will go down and deliver them. Now it's interesting in Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, that when this is the cries of the saints, by the way, that are up in heaven, they've been martyred. It says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar of souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? That's the same thing that Jesus Christ said is going to happen. You're going to cry, and you're going to cry, and you're going to cry out. There's going to be some tarrying. And what does he say at the end of verse 7? Though he bear long with them, there's going to be a space of time. And it's going to seem sometimes like the Lord doesn't hear, but it's not that he hasn't heard. How long, O oh Lord? And we know at the end of the tribulation, just seven years after, we, I don't know what point that they got martyred, but sometime at the end of that seven year period, we know that Jesus Christ himself should touch down upon the face of this earth and that it's all over. He will avenge them speedily. That's what the Bible says. Justice is coming because the judge is coming due to the cries of his people. But the thing to remember is that the Lord doesn't always judge now and He doesn't always judge in our timing. We always expect it to happen now. Come Lord Jesus, come quickly. Believe me, He, he loves us. He doesn't want to see us suffer. But He's appointed a day in which He'll judge the world in righteousness by that man, Christ Jesus, whom He has ordained, whereof He hath given assurance unto all men, and that He hath raised Him from the dead. Well, why doesn't God judge them now? Well, because of the long-suffering of the Lord. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all men should come to repentance. He's given them room. they got a little space of time. He's bearing long with them. But doesn't it say in our text that God will avenge them speedily? Well, yeah. But define this speedily. Moses said, For a thousand years are in thy sight as but yesterday. And when it's past as a watch in the night, Peter said, One day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. In other words, He is coming. His long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, and in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be? Men ought always to pray and not faint. Why? Because Christ is coming to execute justice. Now let me ask you this question. Where would the persecution be coming from? We look at the context. And Jesus may be addressing the disciples about always praying, but who's listening into the conversation? The Pharisees. And I find that very interesting. That as he's talking to the disciples, the same thing is true of them. He tells them, 
you're looking for the Messiah, you're looking for the Lord, I'm standing right in front of me. I've, I've shown myself in signs and wonders and, and every which way, search the scriptures for them, you think you have life, but they are they which testify of me. I mean, how, how else can I show you? I've, I've told you out of my own lips that I am your Messiah. But when he's telling this parable, who's being persecuted? It's ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ who's going to go to the cross by the hands of who? The Pharisees. The disciples are going to be persecuted by who? Acts chapter 4, when they're brought before the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees. And they have to open up their eyes to the fact that there's going to be a, a certain fiery judgment where even Jesus tells the, the disciples, hey, don't fear man that can only destroy or kill the body and can't do anything to the soul, but fear Him who's able to destroy both body and soul into hell. In other words, the disciples or the Pharisees over here, hey guys, you know, if you don't get wake up and if you don't get if you keep denying me and resisting me, your only destination, you will be judged for your unrighteous acts. And you know what, what did Peter say in, as he's preaching from Pentecost? Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus and Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as yourselves also know him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God you have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God had raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it wasn't possible that he should be holding of it. And they were in, they were in grave danger of going to hell. They had to wake up to that fact. They needed to be aware and be alert. It was an admonition to the Pharisees to repent and turn to Him for salvation, but it was an admonition also for the disciples to hold fast their confidence to the end. And Jesus told of the persistent widow in order to encourage His disciples to persevere in faith in the midst of all these hardships and trials. Hey, guess what has been going on since the very beginning of time and is still going to go on. When you look at the book of Hebrews chapter 11, it says there were many who were sawn in half. Many who were dwelling in caves, they didn't have any dwelling place, who were pilgrims and strangers here in this land, persecuted to the ends of this earth, thrown into dens of lions and everything else. How they want to persevere. The Lord knew how dark and bleak the days would be between His resurrection and His return. And His words were meant to encourage or invigorate the disciples for the challenge to regulate their thinking and actions. They were to be consumed with the passion for justice before His throne and to look for Him to return to settle all accounts and that justly. Jesus then tacked on the unexpected question that He asked His followers, when He returns, will He find faith on this earth? Now can you imagine that question coming from the lips of Jesus? Are you going to be like these faithless Pharisees? Where all the scriptures in the world tell them that, that Jesus Christ is coming, and this is His first coming, the first advent. They had every scripture under the sun, you know, when it comes to the, the law and the prophets and everything else, they had all the scriptures to prove that this was indeed the Christ, and yet they, 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 did, they were faithless. And this untoward generation of Jesus would say many times, you brood of vipers... You faithless generation. You disciples of hell. You of your father, the devil, and everything else. And he tells his disciples, are you, are you guys going to be just as faithless when I return back? I can't imagine what that would have been like. Will I find a faithful generation that's persevered in prayer, or will I find another generation like these godless Pharisees? Will we treat like Christ, like the Pharisees treated Him, with hatred and contempt, or will we hold fast our confidence in Him? I have one last scripture that I want to share with you. I want to cut this down for you, but Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 through 37 says this, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which had great recompense of reward, for you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God that you might receive the promise for yet a little while. And he that shall come will come and will not tarry. 
And now the just shall live by faith. The Hebrews, as Paul is writing to the Hebrew believers there, because of the persecution, they wanted to go back to the old system. And Paul would tell them over and over again, Christ is better. We have a better covenant. We have a better Christ. We have a better sacrifice. We have better everything. Why would you go back to that? You want to be made a gazing stock and people are going to laugh and mock. They want to set you up and bring you before trials. But don't cast away your confidence. Let us approach unto Christ. Let us go without the camp. Let us look for that, that, that heavenly city. Let's, let, let us look, go to Mount Zion where the promises are. Let us go to the innumerable company of angels. Let us gather around the Christ who saved us and died for us and taken away every one of our sins. Nothing in the world can replace that. Let us continue to call upon the name of the Lord who saved us. Let us lift up every injustice to Him. He's coming. What's that promise that He gives to us? He says, He shall come, He will come, and He will not tarry. We know the end of the matter is that when He does come speedily, when He touches down on the Mount of Olives, the first thing that He does is execute justice and He executes judgment here upon the face of this earth and the reins of the government will be upon His shoulders. He'll bring in everlasting peace. When I look at this prayer that Jesus is giving to the disciples, it's a rebuke to the Pharisees. I am the Christ. And you can persecute my people all you want to, but one day I'm coming back. You might deny me now, but there's going to come a day where I come back and I'm going to execute justice. And as for my people, keep crying unto me. Keep lifting up your voice, even as uh, in James chapter 5, where those hirers were, were taking advantage of their laborers, and their voices are crying out and lifted up, just as in the Exodus, the, God's Hebrew children were their voices lifted up into heaven. God hears and God sees and God knows our hearts, and He wants to. But that little space, the long suffering of the Lord, hoping and praying and pleading that men will come to repentance. Are we still looking for the second coming of Christ? Do you still believe He's going to come back again? Those are going to be the people that's going to be praying. I believe that's the point. If we'll just keep our faith, hold fast our confidence to the end, we'll see the fruit of Christ actually coming to this earth. Now, you and I, we're waiting for the rapture. We're not looking for that great revelation where... Uh, we're saved from that wrath to come and praise the Lord for that. But He wants us to pray. And we need to pray from the sincerity of our heart. Some people pray to be seen, but we ought to pray for sincerity. Some people pray to be heard, but we ought to pray from a heart of humility. Let us pray tonight. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You so much for Your Word. And can we, Lord, You challenge our hearts. When we look at the new stations and everything going on around us, whether it's our own governments, whether it's people not coming to church, whether it's a hundred things that we could list tonight, the first thing on many people's hearts is to go and to murmur and complain about what they see going on. But you say to lift up everything in prayer to you. Just handling everything over to you because you said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. We know that you'll right every wrong. We know that justice is coming because the great judge is coming. And Lord, help us to live confidently in that. There's nothing that anybody could say or do against me because, Lord, it's all about you. You're coming. You'll make it right. Lord, I don't have to defend myself. I don't have to proclaim my righteousness. I don't have to...
do those things. My only responsibility is to be like Noah, the preacher of righteousness, who says there is coming a day in which God will judge this earth. And help us to be faithful in spreading that gospel message. Help us to be faithful in warning people about the wrath to come. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.